Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 26. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks through the Apostle Paul. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. And the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness At the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is God's holy and inspired word. Thanks be to him. What I want to help us do tonight is understand things that I never really understood till I was in my late 20s. It took me that long because no one really explained it to me. It's kind of sad if you think about it. Someone who had been going to church for many, many years didn't understand the basics of even the opening chapters of Genesis and how the apostles interpreted it. So what I want us to do is we consider the creation of man and mankind, how he created us in his own image and true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, and in communion with him. I want us to understand these basics Maybe we've heard them before. Maybe we think we don't need to hear them again. But trust me, we need to hear these things over and over and over again in order to understand what it is that God has done for us. Because upon eating the forbidden fruit, Adam, our covenantal representative, we need to understand these words. He was our covenantal representative in the Garden of Eden. He fell from the estate of of original righteousness, and his sin was thereby transferred or imputed to all of his offspring. Who are his offspring? Everyone. Everyone who is born of ordinary generation. Ordinary generation meaning a man and a woman come together and have a child. So in other words, everyone, everyone has this imputation of Adam's sin, this transfer of of sin is ours. This is the reason why sin and death have entered the world, and there's no way around this. Adam's sin is the reason for all murder, lies, lust, covetousness, broken promises, idolatry, blasphemy, pride, rebellion. It's the reason why people would rather go shopping or do yard work or watch football rather than worship God. It's the reason why children disobey their parents. It's the reason why parents are not good parents. It's the reason why people steal instead of work hard. It's the reason why every bad thing that has ever happened has happened. Because we have lost communion with God. And we think of ourselves as gods. Because that original righteousness that we once had turned into such a 
pervasive sin and misery that we cannot pull ourselves out of the depths of it. Now, as you know, this is called the bad news. I know we don't love to hear about it, but it is the reason why the world is the way it is. It's the reason why there is such a chasm, a gap between us and God, because our covenantal representative in the garden was a failure. And therefore, we too are failures and have been separated from communion with God. And that brings us to the point of our sermon tonight. And the point is this. Because of the fall of Adam from his original righteousness, sin and death spread to all mankind, leaving us all as sinners in need of a righteousness that is not our own. Because of the fall of Adam from his original righteousness, sin and death spread to all mankind, leaving us all as sinners in need of a righteousness that is not our own. We'll consider this in three points tonight. First, Adam's original righteousness. Second, original sin. And finally, One of my favorite terms, alien righteousness. Again, because of the fall of Adam from his original righteousness, sin and death spread to all mankind, leaving us all, every single one of us, as sinners in need of a righteousness that is not our own. Original righteousness, original sin, and alien righteousness. So let's begin with original righteousness. It is difficult to comprehend. But when God created Adam and entered into a covenant with him, remember that covenant in the Garden of Eden? Different different names for it. The covenant of works, the covenant of life, God's covenant with Adam. When he did that, what he was offering Adam as the covenantal representative of all mankind, everyone here in this room, Everyone who goes to this church and all the churches in our area and every, everyone in Michigan and everyone in the United States and everyone who's ever lived. That's who Adam represented in the garden in this covenant. He represented everyone. It's like when you vote for someone to go represent you in, in, uh, like as a state representative, uh, in the House of Representatives, as a senator, you vote for them to represent you. But once they get there, They do what they're going to do. You can't be accountable for their vote once you've voted them in. Well, Adam, in the covenant of works, represented us, and his failure becomes our failure, whether we like it or not. And because of that failure, it's hard for us to grasp. It's hard for us to comprehend that Adam truly was righteous. He was really without sin. In the eyes of God, Adam had done no wrong. God created him that way. In the image of God, he created him. So Adam had broken no laws. He had transgressed no covenant. And I think this is difficult for us to comprehend, at least it's difficult for me to comprehend, because it's something that has never been true of us. We can't even go a couple of minutes without sinning. It's difficult to comprehend because it's something that's never been true of us. Since our conception, we've never gone a heartbeat without sin. Since birth, we've never taken a breath without defilement. As much as we love babies, right? Babies are sinners. Toddlers are sinners. I don't need to tell you that one, right? Just like all of the other humans have lived, everyone is a sinner. You know, in our morning service, about eight, ten minutes into our service, we confess our sins to God to the one and only mediator of the Lord Jesus Christ. We hear the law, and we confess our sins, and it takes us two or three minutes to sin again because we can't focus on God's glorious grace offered to us in the ordinary means for longer than a few minutes before our our eyes start to wander, our minds start to wander. We start looking at our watch. We think about what we're doing later. We may be here in the pews, but our hearts and our minds are not fully into it. Now, maybe, maybe you're perfect. Maybe you, you make it all the way until after the service before you sin. But the point is, we sin. 
And although we have been forgiven of our sin, we still struggle with this, this comprehension. Even though we have, Christians, have been declared righteous, we are not yet perfect. As Martin Luther put it, another one of my favorite terms, simul justus et peccator. Simul justus et peccator. In other words, we are simultaneously righteous and yet sinners. God has justified us and yet we still sin. Simul justus et peccator. Simultaneously righteous and yet sinners. And for that reason, it's difficult to wrap our minds around the fact that our covenantal representative, our first father, the one who was created from the dust and by the breath of God, truly was righteous. Without sin. In the sight of God, he was just. And that's because of this term, original righteousness. Something that none of us possess and we never will. We read this in our Shorter Catechism, right? You've all learned this one since babies. Shorter Catechism question number 10. How did God create man? God created man, male and female, after his own image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creatures. What an opportunity our first parents had. Perfect communion with God in the presence of the Trinity in his holy mountain garden temple with dominion over his creatures and the privilege, the opportunity to serve him by protecting the Garden of Eden. They were holy. They were undefiled. They were without sin, perfectly righteous. They had everything they needed for success Really, success is eternal life, and they had everything they needed for that. They had the opportunity of eternal life upon what? Upon their perpetual, perfect obedience of Adam. He didn't need to add anything to the the gift of righteousness that God gave him, that original righteousness. He needed to add nothing to it. All he needed to do was remain in it by doing simply what God said. You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it's not like they didn't have anything to eat. They had everything they needed. Just one tree. Don't eat from that tree. And in the garden, they were aware of their blessedness. They were aware of their communion with God. And Adam was well aware of the consequence of sin. Created in the image of God, reflecting his glory and righteousness, Adam was well aware of the eternal punishment that awaited him. Adam understood that he was in a covenant, and he understood the ramifications of his disobedience. Remember what God said, In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Dying, you shall die. You shall die dead. Those are different ways that it can be translated from the Hebrew to English. Dying, you will die. You will die so much. You'll be really dead. But that threat wasn't enough. The threat wasn't enough. Perhaps the serpent is right, Adam begins to think. Maybe it's worth it. Communion with God is pretty good, but maybe he's keeping something from us. God's garden temple is beautiful, but maybe there's something even more beautiful that this slithering serpent knows about and we don't. All the fruit of the trees in the garden that God gave us tastes wonderful, but this one's got to be even better. Dominion over the earth and the creatures, that's pretty fun. I, I like that. But I think I also want to have God under my feet as well. Reflecting God's glory is nice and all, but it sounds like there's something even more over there with the snake. Righteousness is great, but there's got to be something better, something more something even more blessed. And beloved, that is how temptation is. That is how sin is. Because that idea, that excuse that man makes, even today when presented with something that goes against God's holy and inspired law, that comes from our first father. It comes from original sin. Yes, Adam was created with original righteousness, but that original righteousness was probationary. It was probationary, meaning it was completely based upon his works. 
upon eating from the forbidden fruit, our first father failed under his probationary period, and he fell from his original righteousness. And that brings us to our second consideration. No longer reflecting that original righteousness, Adam was dead in sin. In theology, we call this original sin. Listen, we call this original sin. Original sin not only refers to the sin of Adam, but it refers to the sin that is transferred to his posterity, that is, all mankind. Okay, So original sin is not just the original sin, but it's how far it spreads, too, if that makes sense. We can see this formula in Romans 5.12. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. We are in Adam. We are guilty of his sin under the covenant of works and our own sin. And I love what Paul says. Even over those who is, whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. So... There's not a single person who can say, yeah, but I wasn't under the covenant of works. My sin wasn't as bad as Adam's. Uh, yes, it was, because he's your covenantal representative. And what have you done since your conception? Just like your first father, you've sinned. This is original sin. I want us to understand that this is what original sin is. Not just Adam's sin, but the fact that it's now ours. And its effect on us. As we confess in our confession, our mind, our body, our soul, its effect on our mind is great. This is called the noetic effects of sin. Why it is we think the way we now think. Why it is that we, we need this alien righteousness. It affects all parts of us, all of our faculties, mind, body, and soul. I don't know about you. I can really almost speak for myself, but growing up, I had absolutely no understanding of this. I don't know why I wasn't just sat down and had this explained to. It would have been so much easier. I would often hear evangelicals say, you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'd say, why? That just sounds weird, doesn't it? Someone telling you that over and over, you need a relationship with Jesus. Tell me why. You need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You need to accept him as your Lord and Savior. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Savior from what? Sounds great. What's he saving me from? Tell me. That's what I wanted to know, but no one told me. And so it took me something like 28 years to really figure this out. That's a long time. Too long. Unless we comprehend what happened in the garden... And subsequently, how Adam's sin became our sin, none of this makes any sense. People can understand the basics, right? Sin, evil, death. But usually what's missing is that it is precisely because of Adam, our covenantal representative. It's because he fell from that original righteousness, and thus we have inherited his sin and death, and we are now dead in sin. This is original sin. And unless we get this whole picture, and unless we understand the power and pervasiveness of original sin, we can't comprehend why we need Christ. It's like we heard this morning in Sunday school, right? Thomas Boston said, the law, the bad news, is the diagnosis of sin, and the gospel is the physician. You need a diagnosis before you can have anything done about it. We need to understand, beloved, we need to help others understand that Adam's one trespass led to condemnation for all men, Romans 5, 16. And his fall caused us, as we confessed earlier, to be dead. Not partially dead, totally dead. And you think, well, everything seems okay. I see people walking around. No, they're dead. And so were you. Dead in sin. As God looked at the earth in the days of Noah, Genesis 6, 5, what did he say? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Why? Original sin. 
as we read in Romans 3.10, Paul puts it plainly. He doesn't mince words. None is righteous. No, not one. Original sin. But aren't some people good, Paul? No. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. No one does good. Not even one. Come on, not even my kids. I, <clears throat> when I was going to seminary, I knew a lady uh, who I worked with, and when she found out that I went to seminary, she said to me, I could never be a Christian. And I said, okay, how come? She said, because of original sin. And I said, explain. And she said, because I know that my kids are innocent and they're not sinners, and Christianity teaches them that they're sinners. And I laughed. Why? Because what does Paul say? He says, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Something else that makes me laugh is when godless, secular people think they have some kind of moral high ground. Whether it's a sociopathic politician or one of their sycophants in the media. Their feet, Paul says, are swift to shed blood. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is how Paul sums up humanity after the fall. After the loss of original righteousness, because of original sin, everyone is dead in sin. The whole world, he says, is held accountable to God. That is the pervasiveness of of original sin. And in Romans 3, he's building up to something. Did you notice? For the first nine, ten verses of that discussion, he's building up. He's laying a foundation so that we would understand that by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. And you're thinking, Paul, why do you have to be such a downer? Paul, why do you always just give us bad news and tell us that we can't save ourselves? And he does that because unless we understand the depth of our depravity from original sin, unless that is made clear, we have no foundation for understanding the gospel. If we truly were good people, would we need God? If we had maintained original righteousness after the fall, would we need a righteousness that comes from outside of us? And because the only way to be righteous is from a righteousness that comes from outside of us, it is thus an alien righteousness because it is not our own. It is extra nos from outside of us. This is one of my favorite terms in theology, alien righteousness. That brings us to our final consideration tonight. What is alien righteousness? Consider how the Apostle Paul preaches to sinners who are suffering from the effects of original sin. He says in chapter 3, verse 20, he tells us how bad we are because of Adam, and he says this, For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And then he says these amazing words, But now. So there's something different. But now. But now what, Paul? The righteousness of God, okay? You understand that you're not God, right? You understand that much? Okay. If the righteousness comes from God, then it doesn't come from you, right? Thus, it is an alien righteousness, completely foreign to what you and I have to offer. Our righteousness, we heard this morning, is filthy rags before God. So do you want filthy rags? Or do you want an alien righteousness? A righteousness that comes from someone else who is in and of himself just. Who is in and of himself righteous and holy, undefiled. Paul continues, having been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. In other words, the whole thing's in the Old Testament. None of this should be a surprise. He says, it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So what he's saying is righteousness will never again come from Adam. Righteousness will never come from your obedience to the law. Righteousness will only come 
from someone else. And it is from the original righteousness of Christ and his active obedience. Remember, we were talking about ordinary generation. Okay? Adam's sin is transferred to his posterity. Everyone who's born of ordinary generation, which is a man and a woman coming together and having a child. There's something different about the birth of Jesus, isn't there? Who's his father? The Holy Spirit conceives in the womb of a virgin. That's alien, okay? That's not normal. Thus, Jesus is not born of ordinary generation. He's conceived of the Holy Spirit, meaning, just like Adam was in the garden, Christ has an original righteousness. But it's not a righteousness that Adam had, and it's not a righteousness that any of us had. It is alien to us because it comes directly from God because he is God in the flesh. Why did he come in the flesh? He came in the flesh at just the right time. He was born of woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who under the law are dead. Our righteousness only comes from Christ. Not by believing in ourselves, but by understanding the depth of our depravity in believing in Christ. That's where our righteousness comes from. Paul continues, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But what? But I'm a good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. But my baby's so cute. Maybe so, but your baby's a sinner. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. What does that mean? What does propitiation mean? It's another pretty cool word in theology, right? It means God's just wrath. His just wrath due for our sin in Adam and for our own individual sin is assuaged. How? By Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And thus, our sin is expiated, removed from us as his alien righteousness becomes ours. And Paul says this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness, alien righteousness, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, God does all the work. God is both just in pouring out his wrath, and he is also the justifier of the one who believes in Jesus. God does all the work. The only way to deal with our problem of the fall from original righteousness, the only way to deal with the problem of the pervasiveness of original sin, the only way it can be dealt with is if God does it himself. For him to be both just, pouring out his wrath on the cross, where Jesus became a propitiation, assuaging the wrath of God, having it on himself. You know, it was our sin that put him there, and yet we're, the, we're not the one who was punished for it. And then him being the justifier, of the ungodly. You know what this is called? This is called the gospel. It's called good news. That God is the one who justifies the ungodly by giving us the righteousness of Christ, alien righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5:21. God made him, that's Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin that we would become the righteousness of God. God made Jesus, the one who had this alien righteousness, God made him to be sin by pouring out his wrath on him that we deserve. Why? So that we would receive his righteousness. Alien righteousness. This is the reason for him coming in the flesh. This is the reason for his perfect, active obedience all of his life. This is the reason for the cross, and this is the reason for his resurrection, that we would be justified. And this is the gospel. Hopefully, it makes sense. 
Hopefully you understand things that it took me a quarter of a century to find out. If we don't have this foundation and understanding, particularly Genesis 2 and 3, if we don't have that understanding of what original righteousness was lost, and we don't understand the depth and the pervasiveness of original sin, that's Adam's sin, which is also now our sin that we're guilty of, including our own sins. If we don't understand these things, then the gospel won't make any sense. The incarnation won't make sense. His active obedience, his sinlessness throughout his entire life, and the cross won't make sense. For God's wrath is poured out on him. Propitiation for our redemption. His perfect righteousness becoming ours. So, beloved, I hope that we can agree that because of the fall, Adam and his original righteousness that he lost, because of that, sin and death spread to all of us, leaving us as sinners in desperate need of a righteousness that is not our own, but God provides that righteousness. And for all those who repent and believe, they have redemption in Christ Jesus. They have gained everything. Why? Because of the alien righteousness of Christ. Thanks be to God for alien righteousness.